Hi, I'm Londa Rolfing. I have the most wonderful job of traveling the country as a sewing educator. I go to guilds and stores, teaching them my brand of creative sewing. Today I'm going to teach you about ruching. Ruching was very popular back in the early 1900s. Think of the first um, garments that were shown on the Downton Abbey series. In a lot of those garments, there was really cool detail like ruching. You can see it here on this christening gown from that era. Do you see this row of very finely gathered fabric? I also did it on this pillow. Now let's zoom in here and look very closely. You can see that at either side of the ruching, which is called puffing in heirloom sewing, we have little rows of holes. Those rolls of holes is what's called entredeau, which is a French term for between two. So let me show you how we can do puffing or ruching. In series 800, I actually taught my way of gathering. And in doing so, what I taught was that what I do is actually backstitch at the beginning when I start to set my gathering rows. I use normal stitch length instead of a longer stitch length because I want those gathers to be very close and tiny. Now, when you're going to do a row that's parallel, not shaped, then what you want to do is actually pull up your top row of threads simultaneously. So can you see I'm actually pulling all this up at the same time? Once that gets all pulled up, then what I would do would be to take my entredeau, determine which side is the prettiest, lay that down, centering it over between those rows, and let's just pretend that I had sewn that. So I would sew it right along that row of the row of holes, and then it would flip open, and then you would see that wonderful row of holes on each side of the puffing or the ruching. You could also accomplish this with the use of a ruffler, which actually puts in little tucks instead of gathering. So you might want to explore that as you do reproduction sewing. But on this top, out of chambray, I have not pulled up the rows simultaneously, but rather shaped it so that the very upper row on my bodice is pulled up tighter than the bottom row. And then I've done something a little different up here. I've taken a bias piece. I've sewed the right side of the bias to the wrong side of the gathers. And then it comes up and around. And then I turn this edge under so it looks like a nice binding. And then when you take some nice top stitching thread, which is a little bit heavier, you can top stitch along there. And you can see that you have then interpreted the look of the early 1900s in your clothing for today. The other thing I'm so excited about teaching you is how you can do tucks and pleats without any math. Instead, we're going to use forks. I did that technique when I made this wedding gown. Can you see this little tucks, tiny, tiny little pleats on each shoulder? We'll talk about how we get those so that they're mirror images of each other. And then I also created the same look, but much wider around the bottom of her skirt. The reason I don't have the whole skirt here is because at weddings, the very bottom gets dirty. So we simply took that pleated section off, took it to the cleaner, and now it can be reattached to the skirt at a shorter length. So let me show you at the sewing machine how we actually can do those tucks without math. I just use a place on the machine. It could be like where this um, bobbin cover breaks to the solid part. So let me just put a little post note there. Features of the machine that you would want to really make use of would be automatic stopping with the needle down and also the needle knee lifter if you have that for the presser foot. So start with a piece longer than what you want. This happens to be a doubled piece. I'm using a quarter inch seam allowance and these are the, the raw edges. It could be a single layer if you desire. So just take a pin and put it in at that point that you've established. Lift your presser foot, pull that pin back until it hits the needle, and then drop the presser foot and sew to the end of that fold you just created. Stop, needle down, come back to that point, put the pin in, lift the presser foot, bring it back to the needle, then you can pull out the pin. I'm going to move this A, it's just right here where this color changes, sew to the end of the pleat, 
stop, needle down. Isn't that easy? I thought it was pretty cool. Now, if I was doing, let me start at the end of this one. If I was doing the other shoulder, then I wouldn't come under, but I'd come up. So I'm going to stick my needle, my pin in, but instead of going under, I'm gonna come up. But you'd have to then sew to the bump that you feel. So here again, I'm gonna go up. I think you're starting to see how cool that is, but you're getting pleat stacked upon pleat. What if you wanted to have space between the pleats? Then you just need to pick another point at your machine bed. So I had A and B here. Let's me just, let's say here. I want it to be that deep. So let's put the pin in, lift the presser foot, bring it all the way back to the needle, and sew to the end of that pleat. Put your pin in. Lift your presser foot up, bring it back to the needle, and sew to the end of the pleat. Pretty cool, huh? And then I saw on the internet that you can do the same thing, as I told you before, with forks or hair picks. So let's get rid of these marks. This is a cool way to do it. Put your fork upside down and one tine in. Then do you see you can just roll this up, pull it out, and stitch. Put the fork in, turn it up. So it's really the same principle, but you're using a fork. If you wanted smaller pleats, how about a pickle fork? You could do the same thing. And again, if you wanted the pleats to go the other way, I have to think about this. Then you go, you rotate towards you. It's just harder to get the fork out. And then before I run out of fabric, I want to show you with my hair pick. Do you see how deep of a pleat you could get? I love to sew, but I really don't like to do math. I don't like to mark. And I just have found there are so many possibilities using these techniques of using something physical to do the math for you. So just start your brain to thinking about all the different ways you could actually make use of this. Have fun as you sew. You're in the driver's seat. You're the one who's coming up with something that's one of a kind. And always think about looking back into history and seeing the details and then reinterpreting those for the clothing that you have today.